Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, a big time lawsuit in the real estate industry may shake up how you buy or sell a house. We've got a guest to talk about it. Stick around. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Kraftwerk Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed, and please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. And this week, a special guest on our show, our in-house real estate expert. And I'm calling you in-house because you're literally in the house with Dan. Dan's wife, Adrian, who is an agent with Heller Coley Reed, which is a Long and Foster brokerage, longtime real estate agent in Maryland and DC. You don't sell in Virginia, which I'm very upset about, by the way. I don't do there. You as my agent in Virginia, if you could help me. (laughs) We'll come back. There's Maryland people and Virginia people, I, I think. I'm aware. Yeah, I, I'm aware <laughs> as a Virginia person. But Adrian Maseka, thank you so much for joining us to talk about what is going on in the world of real estate these days. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I think your favorite thing is being on video with us, that you're like super excited for this process. Yeah, so I am not good on video, not good being recorded. Um, I had to do a work video recently and I ended up just crying. And we're, so we're going to try not to make you cry. I really hope that's not the function of our show today. And, <laughs> and if you're listening to this on our air, you'll know that wasn't the result because I'm not going to put a video out where we make Dan's wife cry. But thank you so much for being willing to bear being on video and, and audio for us to, to help educate our audience about the world of real estate. Oh, thank you so much. Yep, I'm I'm ready. So we're bringing this up and we talk about homes and and real estate a lot because obviously it's a a big part of the average person's net worth. It's a big part of their wealth. It's a big part of where their money goes. So it's, it's a big decision, but there's a lot changing right now. And I think a lot of this stems from a lawsuit in the fall. So can we start there on what happened with the National National Association of Realtors and why was there a lawsuit brought? Sure. So, um, yeah, there was a big lawsuit back in the fall um, that was um, a judgment came down. It was the Sitzer Burnett lawsuit. And basically what it said was that the real estate industry as a whole, as well as some other brokerages that they held accountable that they were guilty of price fixing, of keeping real estate commissions artificially high. And so home sellers brought this lawsuit because a large part of a real estate transaction is the fact that the seller, the commissions come from the seller's proceeds. Um, And then uh, just a couple weeks ago, I believe on March 15th, um, the National Association of Realtors did come to a settlement. They agreed to pay $418 million in damages to home sellers. And they also agreed to make two big rule changes in our industry, one of which is to not advertise any longer uh, the buyer rate commission in our multiple listing system. And then the other Uh, which I think will also be interesting, is that before we go out with a buyer, before we show them a house, we need to enter a formal written buyer agency agreement with them. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. So it starts with an accusation essentially of collusion, that the brokers are like, hey, we're this is how it's always been done, but we're going to not fight each other on this. Does that suggest that realtor commissions were not negotiable in the past? So so if I were to sell a house and and I engage with any agent, right? Let's not make it personal to any individual. And I said, hey, listen, I I think this thing's going to sell really quick. This is what I'd like to pay as a a commission. Mm -hmm. Is that a number that I could work on? Or was there something structural in place keeping them high? Well, um, and then 
National Association of Realtors has maintained this, that commissions have always been negotiable. There has been an industry standard of between 5 and 6% total, which typically the listing broker, the one representing the seller, shares with the buyer's agent. I mean, I've, I've definitely seen and heard of listings with lower commissions. They're even very popular, like publicly traded brokerages that will, that they, they publicize that they're willing to do transactions for lower rates than other traditional brokerage houses as well. So like, even though five or six tends to be the standard, that's clearly not always the case. Yes, it's been, you know, there have been uh, brokerages who have a model with a, you know, a a lower um, commission rate. There have been limited service brokers. So, you know, it it has always been negotiable. And um, yeah. My my grandmother is also a longtime real estate agent, and I just she tells this story a lot where she was representing a very large condo, I believe, and the person said, "Well, if if it sells in a couple days, I want to pay like X percent, like two percent instead of five. So again, it's negotiable. That was on the table. Her retort was, "If it sells in a couple days, I think I've earned my full five, and that's how it's going to be." Which I love that story, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you're you're. You're paying me because it's going to go fast, not despite it going fast, right? Like, right. Is, is that part of the talent? Which I would suspect some of this right now is being born out of the fact that home inventories are super low. It's easy to sell a home right now because there's too many people trying to buy homes and you've got tons and tons of sellers. Like when I mm-hmm. sold, this was early 2022. We had something like 60 people view the house in three days. We took in like three offers and sold it the next day. Like it was on the market for like four and a half days is basically how long it was on the market. 60 people wanted to see it, which is seems like a lot. I don't, I don't know what the average number of showings is that, that a home gets before it it actually sells, but it seems pretty easy to sell in this current environment. Is this just like a whiplash to that or or is there something structurally like wrong here? I get a lot through osmosis because I get to see transactions happen f- firsthand, basically. And I think that a lot of people put emphasis on the first part of the real estate transaction, which is listing a house and having someone show it and the people agree to buy it. That is the part that seems to be being democratized with all these different platforms online where you can find houses, get pictures, schedule showings, like all that stuff seems pretty easy. I think the thing that a lot of people forget is what happens after that can be very difficult. And when I think about who the losers of this might be, I I think about how important it is to have a good agent shepherding someone through the back half of the contract and making sure it gets to closing. So as I'm thinking about the outcome of this settlement, I'm trying to think of who wins and I don't I can't figure out who the winner is at all because in theory it seems like home sellers should be winning out because they'll be keeping more of their money. But part of me thinks that house prices are gonna change in the long run in response to this because people are gonna be like, well, before your comp included compensation to this other agent that's no longer a factor. Like, why am I paying you that amount when it should really be lower? Like, does that make sense at all the way I'm thinking about this? I mean, it makes sense to me, right? You're basically, you're almost thinking about it like a a credit card fee at like a a restaurant or something, right? Like you go in and, and like we, I think, understand that most of us are paying with credit cards and somewhere they've had to build that into their P&L. So on a place that is cash only and isn't dealing with that, you would expect prices to be a little bit lower because they're not dealing with that haircut. Is that, is that kind of how you're looking at it? That like, yeah, if you're, if you're right. going to take that out of the middle and we know that you're taking it out, that we're not going to give you the exact same thing because you're not giving us the same convenience. Right, exactly. So if I'm negotiating, I'm be like, that's a garbage comp. You can't use that anymore because that included all this stuff, which is no longer relevant to our transaction. I have to pay my agent now out of pocket. That's a cost of acquisition for me. So in exchange, I'm offering X dollars on. Now, supply and demand is going to influence that as well. But I think that's true. So I think 
the sellers probably aren't winning in the long run. Buyers are losing because you think of a first time home buyer. Now I need my down payment for, for the purchase price. And I need to pay an agent who's going to help me. And if I don't have an agent, like I'm either at the whim of the seller's agent who has a vested interest in me buying this property, or I have to schedule all this stuff I've never done before. So I lose. Agents lose because now there's less of a structural support system. So I just can't figure out who wins, who wins this settlement. Um, and I think that another part of it, too, to, to that point, is that a, a lot of, you know, discussion has been around, um, you know, will agents show properties where there are reduced or zero commission offered by the seller? And I think another point to that that we've been talking about a lot is, well, actually, is the question is a buyer going to want to see a property where they will have to pay their own agent an extra two or 3% on top of down payment, which is hard to, to save for transfer and recordation fees, um, all of the um, lender related fees, all their closing costs that they have to be responsible for. How, How many homes on average do you think you show a first time home buyer, like, like somebody that comes to you has never purchased a home before. Mm -hmm. How many either days or homes do you have to take them through before they, they feel comfortable making a decision? Well, I think, you know, it's different from their early days when I got into real estate around 2012, you know, there were, I would say you could go easily see six houses, you know, in a day and there was, you know, options out there. And now I think that um, buyers are lucky if, you know, maybe one comes up a week that they can go and see, and then they have to be ready to, you know, make an offer on that house because the inventory, at least in the Washington metropolitan region is extremely low right now. Um, So, I mean, I would say fewer than 10 because of the market that we're in and the limited inventory. But so, okay, because of a function of there just not being either that many houses out there or in the appropriate range, so you're not showing them that many. It used to be six in a day. That's a lot of houses. Well, yeah, I guess, you know, we we recommend, actually, you don't go beyond five. Okay. Because then you won't remember, you know, what was each house, you know, you won't know. Like, <laughs> it's like having children after five, you're like, I don't know who you are. Yeah. You, you yeah. just live here and eat my food. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get hungry as well. You know, you can't, it's very, it's very tough. You've got to bring snacks, water. You, you've got to be prepared for those situations. I, you know, I think about this a lot because I am sort of in the process and I'm calling myself a casual shopper right now. Like I'm, I am actively looking, I'm like sort of prepared to make that decision, but I'm not. I'm not like quite ready to pull the trigger and it's very difficult as a home buyer because I want to go through and like kind of touch stuff and like see the homes and see the condition they're in. Cause I think admittedly some of the photos are generous. Let's just call it that. Right. Like the photos can be taken from angles and with lenses that are very generous to what's actually in the property. And I want to go see stuff, but I also don't want to inconvenience the agent I've been working with and have him, need to take me around and open all these doors if I'm not that serious about writing an offer. And I don't know if that's just like weird on my part, but do I really need him to open the door for me? Like, I I guess that that's ultimately where we're getting to is like, is that a, is that service for buyers of taking them through the house? Is that what, what's going to get sacrificed here? I mean, recently there was a brokerage, a a brokerage that had discounted fees that actually enabled buyers to go on their own. They would program the lockbox so that buyers could access houses on their own and kind of, you know, do that by themselves if they wanted to. I would say that door opening is not one of the things that makes an agent valuable, but At the same time, I would say that you're not inconveniencing your agent. I mean, I've worked with buyers sometimes for years on end. You know, that is a nicer person than than 
I am. So I, I, I appreciate that, that you would have the patience to spend years with somebody while they tr- try to buy a house. If I was on the other side of that transaction, I'd be like, just pick one. Let's go. This is why I'm not in your business because I, I'd, I'd be completely furious at these people of like, it's just a house. Just, just pick one, buy it. Let's, let's get it going. Right. But that doesn't work, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is correctly why I'm not a real this, estate agent. This I, has I, become I, a therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, gosh. No, I mean, I think, you know, every that's the thing. I think that's one of the values of an agent is that you're with somebody who's with you over the long haul, you know, whether, you know, you buy the first house that you go see or if it takes, you know, a year or so to to do. There's an agent on my team who yesterday ratified a deal with a home seller that she has represented for the past five years. I mean, she did not have children when they signed that first listing agreement. And now she has two. Okay. I mean, this is, I, I think like that's the, maybe perhaps what might be getting lost a little bit in, um, you know, the, the lawsuit uh, coverage is that it, you know, an agent is more than a door opener. For, for sure. And, and I, I, I'm being a little bit flippant in how I'm talking about this. Right. And, and that's generally my role on our show is to be the one that like constantly, li- literally clients will get on the, on the phone with me and be like, well, I heard you talk about it on the, on the show. I know you hate my rental property. It's like, I don't hate your rental property. I mean, y- you do, but you're not going to start with that. <laughs> no, I, it's, it's not that I hate it. I just, I want to get into the math and I want somebody to prove to me that it makes a good deal. Right, you shouldn't you shouldn't buy real estate just because someone said you should buy real estate. You should right. do the math and work it out for yourself. That's it. That's my time. only point ever. Is I think people are bad at doing the math and they haven't done that math very correctly. And yeah, so when it's talked about that real estate's the only way to build wealth, I'm like, this is nonsense. It is a way to build wealth. I'm not against owning property either as an investment or for personal use. So. Mm-hmm. I, I'm normally the bear on our show and and I feel like I'm constantly now having to defend that position because it's not really my perspective. I just, I want to be honest about the math. Sorry, we're, we're straying from the point of like, am I going to be the first one that buys a house and I have to pay somebody to, to help me buy it? Am I, am I going to be the first guy that's ever had to pay a, a commission on the buyer side, because now I'm the one in this seat. I have pretty bad timing with houses. So that would make sense <laughs> to me that, that I'm the first guy to get screwed by this. But mm-hmm. is that where we're headed? Is that buyers are going to have to pay the agent directly? Well, I think that, you know, something that the lawsuit uh, and the settlement has opened up is just this idea of we want choice, basically. But I think that for, me personally, and for, you know, a lot of listing agents that I know and work with, we are going to fight to make sure that a buyer agent is compensated and that the buyer is not liable for that expense because we know that when the seller has good representation and the buyer has good representation, that makes for a stronger, fairer deal, you know, and you have you know, two professionals working towards a common goal. And so I think, you know, I don't think that just because the obligation is removed, that sellers, when presented with their choices, will make the choice to not pay. That, that's interesting. I mean, I, that'll be interesting to watch as this develops and, and flows through the system of, of who's actually continuing to, to list in more of a traditional way and, and who's coming at it and trying to strip as much out of this deal as possible and kind of list in a cheap way. But if they can't advertise that, will we not know until the contract is written? How, how does that get found out in this new world? If you can't Mm -hmm. advertise the commission, like when do you find out? That's a good question on on the deal. (laughs) It is a good question. Um, I, I feel like we will have to rely on our relationships, call the agent, talk it out, see, you know, what the seller is offering. Um, And, you know, while you cannot 
advertise commissions in the MLS, you are still able to advertise concessions. So while a seller cannot obligate that the concessions are used to pay your buyer's agent, they can offer a concession and the buyer can choose to do with that money what they wish. Interesting. So you can offer a cash back generally to the buyer of the house somewhere in your listing as a concession, whether that is a an actual commission or not, that is like, hey, we're going to give you some portion of the proceeds towards the transaction. Exactly. Yep. Um, so that has been kind of put out there as a way to pay buyer's agents. Um, some articles I've seen have also said that maybe some agents will be paid hourly, but I think in light of what we've discussed about year long relationships, I'm not sure exactly how that would work. (laughs) Yeah. It, it feels like a system where the way it's worked is that some deals are probably easier than others. And generally over time, it's going to smooth itself out that the amount of time you spend helping somebody buy a home is ultimately compensated by the number of transactions that you're participating in. And that just kind of works itself out across the system. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's a weird place for me because I, I think we're generally fans of transparency. I want to know mm-hmm. what I'm paying for stuff. I'd like to know what am I paying? Who does it go to? What am I paying for? What is the actual service I'm receiving? Because otherwise I can't evaluate it when things are like, oh, it's free. Like it's not free. Buying a house isn't free, right? Like there Mm -hmm. is effort for that agent that is on both sides of the transaction. And now we're negotiating, well, how much? What did you really do for me? How much time did you spend on this? And people are trying to get nitpicky about it. And we see that in our world too, right? People, Mm -hmm. they want a flat fee instead of an AUM fee or they want an hourly fee. instead. Like people want those different options. Right. But I could tell you with certainty that the people that work with us on an hourly basis end up getting the most limited version of the experience. Like a hundred percent because they're getting explicitly to this is, this is the answer I wanted. And we go no further. We're, they're going, we're going to the end of their mm-hmm. question, not the end of the process. And that's, right. that's really interesting. Cause if that flows into home buying, if the incentive is let's get this done with as few hours as possible, cause I'm paying for hours, that's not mm-hmm. necessarily leading to better outcomes. It's just leading to less hours spent. And I think that's why they, one of the rules changes is to have these buyer agency agreements written and executed before anything happens so that a buyer knows, okay, this is what I'm going to pay this agent in the event that the seller does not pay it so that it's spelled out from the get-go. Yeah. So that's what they're going to have to commit to, to even work with a buyer's agent. We're going to have to sign an agreement that says, this is how I'm going to pay you. You're either going to get it from the listing or I pay it out of pocket. Is that how the, the deals are going to have to be structured? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that, yeah. it's, it's wild because it influences what houses you're going to look at. Well, mm-hmm. totally. And I, I see so much, Ross commented on it earlier, so much reflective of our industry too, because it's easy to say commissions are bad, right? How often have we talked about like front loaded mutual funds? And that's not always a great solution, but they were pitched very heavily where to buy into a fund, you're going to pay a five or 6% fee right off the top. Your mon- that money's never going to hit the investment. But for some people, that might be the best option if you're looking for guidance. Like if I have $500 to my name and I want the help of a professional like I'm not going to go pay someone hourly. It's ridiculous. <laughs> People probably won't take that on an AUM like asset management basis. That's What's one percent of five hundred bucks? Yeah, it rounds to zero. <laughs> and then uh, you know, if you sit with a professional who's willing to sell on a commission basis, like that might be a deal they would do because that could be add-on business in the future. It gets their whatever sales target up. Like that might be the best way to talk to a professional, get feedback and get put into something that would be productive. So I just feel like there's a corner of the market that's going to be losers. And they probably are first time home buyers at like lower entry points who are like just 
eked enough into their account to get their first home. And now they've got to come up with thousands of extra dollars potentially to pay an agent. It's just like a slap in the face unless other arrangements are made. Because I guess you can always put an offer in that says, I'll buy this house, but you're going to pay my agent for me as part of the deal. Like that, that could be a thing, right? And, and I kind of worry about that from, because, and, and I mean, it may work differently in a different market, but the, the nature of the market we're in now in at least our area is super competitive. There are a lot of houses that get multiple bids. And I feel like if, you know, this is one of those points where could a deal be lost on this point, worrying about who's going to pay the the buyer's agent. And I just don't like that because I want to be able to kind of have my head completely working for my client and not have to worry, okay, how much is my client going to pay me? How much is the seller going to pay me? Is it going to be some combination, you know, uh, so I, I feel like um, in order to, I think that that's the part that's a little bit unsettling is just not knowing that how that's really going to shake out. And I'm sure different markets are going to shake it out differently. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I think it's, it's an area that's clearly open for discussion on like what should be the right answer. But I don't know that putting it all on the buyer is going to be productive because especially in starter homes where coming up with a down payment is difficult and you know, it's easier to get to the price point you want if you're going to borrow a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have a lot more purchase power with your monthly payment and your ability to make that payment than having to save that down payment. And so if you have to get to the down payment plus a commission, every time you buy a home now, it's just going to put home ownership further out of reach for more people. And it's already a challenging market to buy a home in because of where we are interest rate wise. Like it, it, it feels like it may have the reverse result of, of what it's trying to when it all shakes out, but we just don't know. I, I think, you know, each agent is going to establish the standards of their business and how they want their business to run, how their go- business is going to tick. And I think as long as we kind of keep one foot in front of the other, um, there's been a general sense that this could be a pivot point that thins out the industry a little bit of agents who, um, you know, are really delivering good service, are delivering on that value proposition for their clients where the clients can see that, that, you know, the the commission being paid is a good investment. And I, you know, and then the other agents are probably going to, you know, go do something, something else. else to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I, go back to their other job. I, I heard a crazy statistic that last year, half of all agents, licensed agents sold zero or one houses. Like that's, that's crazy. So there is a lot of competition in the space of people with real estate licenses I mean, there's a a joke in the beer industry that like every bartender has a real estate license as well, which has panned out to be true in in many cases that I've been aware of. So I think some thinning of the herd might be a good thing. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, having higher quality agents in the pool to pick from might be a value in the end. Uh, So hopefully there can be more things that turn to positive with this than negative. Well, Adrian, we, we really appreciate you joining us to talk through kind of what's what's going on, what's happening in that world. We wish you smooth passage through it. And uh, uh, if I were buying in Maryland, I would certainly work with you, but I can't do it. I can't cross the river. I'm sorry. I think you can, Ross. No. I mean, just <laughs> come. <happen>. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck in Virginia, wherever you uh, are. <laughs> <laughs> wherever in that crazy state you end up. I, I will put a plug for Adrienne's blog. She writes a basically weekly blog called The Realtress. Great insights on real estate and life. She touched on this and a couple different issues. I get it to my inbox and have the privilege of pre-reading before publishing, but how would someone find you otherwise? 
So I just um, on Substack. So if you go on Substack and look for the Realtress, you'll find me. And um, yeah, that would be amazing if you subscribe to my blog. Sometimes I write about real estate. Sometimes it's about Dan and Romy. So <laughs> Blue, who's howling in the background at any given yeah, point in our show. Definitely. Blue makes an appearance or two. Awesome. <laughs> We are very appreciative of your time. Thank you so much. And for all of our regular listeners, check your balances at outlook.com is the email address for our show. Drop us a line if you've got questions, feedback. Hopefully your podcast feed is working right now. We've we've tried to, to double check it, but hope all is well. We will catch you guys next week.